In the last lecture, we've discussed victims. The lines between victims and perpetrators are often porous. The child soldier dilemma illustrates this tension. The ICC confirmed in the Lobanga case that recruiting children under 15 into forces or armed groups is a war crime. But child soldiers often also commit horrific atrocities. Their victims find little comfort in the fact that child soldiers are merely victims. One of the key examples is former child soldier Dominic Ongwen. Dominic Ongwen was abducted by the Lord Resistance Army. He had to punish civilians who refused to help the LIA, fight Ugandan soldiers and abduct more youth to fill the ranks. He faced his trial at the ICC as an adult for some of the crimes that he suffered as a child, such as enslavement as a crime against humanity. How can a criminal process deal with such tensions? This is what we will explore in this session. Involvement of children in conflict is a complex phenomenon. Some children enter conflicts voluntarily, driven by ambition, patriotism, or the promise of opportunity. Other children are recruited through violence or threats. There are many reasons why they are used in conflict. Often, shortage of troops is used as an argument by commanders. But there are other factors. Children are attractive fighters since they are obedient, easy to manipulate, and open to dangerous assignments. Some of them have strong incentives since membership in armed groups gives them power and prestige. The phenomenon cuts across sexes. About 40% of child soldiers worldwide are girls. Some of them serve as combatants or leaders, but many of them are used as sex slaves. The role of children typically varies according to the child's age, gender and abilities. Some children fight alongside adults in hostilities or serve as guards. Other play support roles in conflicts by maintaining camps or providing any other support required by combatants. The criminal process must take into account these distinctions. But how is this done? Children have a special status under international law. Article 3 of the Conventions on the Rights of the Child states that the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration in all actions concerning children. The principles and guidelines on children associated with armed forces or armed groups state expressly that child soldiers who commit crimes should be considered primarily as victims of offenses against international law not only as perpetrators. This reading is confirmed by the ICC statute. Article 26 states that the court shall have no jurisdiction over any person who was under the age of 18 at the time of the alleged commission of the crime. This provides a strong signpost against the prosecution of crimes committed by child soldiers under the age of 18 by international courts and tribunals. The Special Court for Sierra Leone had jurisdiction to prosecute children of 15 years and older, but it did not use this prerogative. To date, no child has been charged in an international tribunal for war crimes or atrocities. There are many arguments to support this approach. Recruitment, enlistment and use of children in hostilities is per se against the best interest of the child. Both the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the ICC in Lubanga have made it clear that the perpetrator cannot rely on the consent of the child as an affirmative defense to child soldier charges. The main responsibility for participation in conflict lies typically with the armed forces or groups who enlist, recruit or accept children rather than with the children themselves. Second, child soldiers often suffer from specific psychological and mental health conditions. The experience of acts of violence and the continued embedding in group structures can hamper the children's development and their ability to function as children. It is in particular doubtful to what extent they can appreciate the contextual elements of international crimes and form the intent necessary for complex offenses. Third, it is difficult to determine a clear-cut age limit in relation to criminal responsibility. The minimum age of criminal responsibility varies from country to country. International criminal law lacks a differentiated juvenile justice system that is typically applied in domestic settings. 
Finally, formal prosecution might not be the best way to deal with accountability. Certain alternatives to criminal proceedings, such as restorative justice mechanisms and social rehabilitation, might be better suited to the needs than traditional means of punishment. Treating child soldiers per se as infants that are incapable of making responsible choice oversimplifies their complex identities. Not all child soldiers have been abducted. Some fight for what they see as a legitimate political cause. Certain children between 15 and 18 might be able to appreciate the wrongfulness of their acts. Many legal systems allow differentiations in the treatment of responsibility according to age. For instance, the Convention on the Rights of the Child does not expressly exclude criminal prosecution of children. In many countries, this responsibility is determined on an individual basis based on the psychological development of the child. Moreover, accountability may serve both the child and the interest of long-term peace. Child soldiers might not be accepted back in their community without some sense of justice by victims. If child soldiers are prosecuted, it is difficult to determine culpability. The criminal justice system typically offers two avenues to accommodate their dual status as victimizer and as victim. Child soldiers can first of all invoke certain defenses. Defenses may exclude criminal responsibility. But the threshold is high. For instance, at the ICC, Dominic Ongwen claimed that he should be excluded from criminal responsibility since he was brainwashed and lived most of his life under duress. The chamber rejected this claim. It held that the law does not recognize such a type of institutionalized duress. Threats must be imminent and eliminate choice. Ongwen could have chosen not to rise in the hierarchy of the LRA. The second approach is the law regarding sentencing. It is more flexible. It allows a mitigation of the sentence. Judges must take into account the individual circumstances of the convicted person. In this way, the traumatic childhood and the conditions of child soldiers can be invoked to reduce the sentence. But they do not preclude responsibility or prospects of reparation by victims. So where does this leave us? In this video, we've seen that there are competing attitudes towards the criminal responsibility of child soldiers. A victim-oriented narrative and an accountability narrative. Prosecuting child soldiers can be both a tragedy and a necessary evil. The criminal trial is a measure of last resort. It tends to reason in binary categories. Guilt and innocence, capacity and incapacity, adult or child, or victim and perpetrator. The child soldier dilemma does not fit neatly into these categories. There is an emerging consensus that children below the age of 18 should not be prosecuted for war crimes and crimes against humanity by international courts. But this does not mean that there are no options for accountability. There are at least three ways to break the strict victim-perpetrator divide. One approach is to hold child soldiers accountable in ways other than criminal prosecutions, for instance by using transitional justice mechanisms such as truth and reconciliation commissions. This approach is in line with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which encourages states to pursue alternatives to judicial proceedings for children. A second approach is to try child soldiers before certain domestic courts but subject to international standards for juvenile justice. Such prosecutions may not present the best way to ensure the interest of the child and should thus be a last resort. A third approach is to hold child soldiers accountable internationally for crimes that were committed by them as adults, namely after the age of 18. This last approach was taken by the ICC in the Ongwen case. In the next model, we will discuss how wrong is remedied and how the criminal justice system can be improved. So please stay tuned.